I believe he expects the same thing of us today if we want revival. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He says his people are to humble themselves, pray, and to seek his face. And we've been looking at this starting last week. What is prayer? Healthy, strong relationships are built on communication. If you want a healthy, strong relationship with anybody, it needs to be built on communication, open communication, back and forth. And God has spoken plenty to us. The question is, are we listening? Are we listening? That's an important part of it. You can, you can hear what someone says. It does not mean you're listening. You ever heard somebody talking and you just heard the noise, but you didn't make out anything intelligible because you weren't really paying attention? You said, huh? You heard the noise, you heard it, but you weren't listening. And so we can hear God. You can be sitting here right now not listening to me. I'm thinking about something else, about what are you, you going to do for dinner tomorrow night or something like that, or what do I have to do at work tomorrow or, or things of that nature. You can do that and not really be here. So you're hearing it, but you're not listening. Communication is important. It's vital. We have to hear what God has to say. That's one aspect of it. The other side is us praying, us talking to God, us just bearing our hearts to Him, opening our hearts up to Him. It doesn't always have to be asking something, but many times that's what it is. That's going to be an important part of prayer is asking. So we've been looking at what is prayer and how should we pray. You know, just to touch on that, we should pray through Jesus Christ. We should pray regularly. We should pray persistently. We should pray making mention of many petitions. And this part is very important. We should pray with submission to God's will. As Jesus prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. Submissive to God's will. Are you in submission to God's will? How many of you want to know the answer to that? Am I in submission to God's will? You say, amen, I want to know the answer to that. Okay, I got a question for you then. Do you obey the parts of the Bible you understand? That's a great way to know if you're in submission to God's will. Oftentimes we hear God's will and we think it's going to be, you know, some mystical thing. And it's like, no, most of His will is revealed for us right there. Now, when it comes to your specific life, there may be some things you're going to have to spend some time with God, get the peace of God about and get direction from Him as He leads you through His Word. But here's one thing God won't do if you're in God's will. He will never lead you contrary to His written Word. God will not lead you contrary to His written Word. People will say, well, God led me to do this. I'm like, no, He didn't. I know for a fact because His Word says this. Whatever the situation is, I know God didn't lead you to do that. You're leading yourself to do that. God did not lead you to do that. So we need to pray in submission to God's will. But now we're looking at this. What should we pray for? What are some of the things we should pray for? Well, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. This is important, the season of year it is right now as we go get really full swing into the election season and all the mudslinging that's about to take place. You know, and we have a responsibility in that and you need to follow your conscience in that. Let me say this, though. I don't have any problem saying this and I could back it up biblically that no Christian should ever vote for a Democrat. Can I say that again? No Christian should ever vote for a Democrat. Not in good conscience, you can't. Not if you stand against abortion. You can't. That's their whole platform. Their platform's pro-abortion, up to birth. You can't in good conscience vote for a Democrat. Here's what I didn't say. I didn't say that means you have to vote for a Republican. Okay, I didn't say that. I did say no Christian should vote for a Democrat. Shame on a Christian if they vote for a Democrat. 
I did not say you have to vote for a Republican. There's independents out there you could vote for, or you could not vote. But that is a vote. People say, oh, then you can't say anything. I'm like, I thought this was the land of the free. Like, you can't have an opinion if you didn't vote. I thought this was the land of the free. I thought we had free choice. Here, give me a better choice. Maybe I'll vote. But vote, don't vote. It's between you and God. It's with your conscience before your God, before the God you serve. But in your voting, you should not violate what Scripture says. We should be careful with that. Again, you're going to have to answer to God for how you vote, and, and that's between you and Him. So as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible says, For kings... Well, I'm sorry, let me go verse 1. I exhort, exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So what should we pray for? We should pray for our civil government. He said, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For civil government. For anybody in authority, really, pray for them. Do you know what that means? Pray for me. Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? I'm in a position of authority as the pastor here. Hebrews says, obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls. Okay, that's talking about the pastor. The pastor. I have to give an account to God for how I lead this church. I'll have to answer to God for that. That's a heavy responsibility. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for our city officials. Pray for the president. Pray for those in civil authority over us. Why? Why should we do that? We're told that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Pray for them so we can live a quiet and peaceable life. I don't want problems. I don't want issues. I don't want to uh, deal with the turmoil that comes with, with what happens in a, in a corrupt nation and when God's judgment falls on a nation. I want to lead a quiet and peaceable life. And here's what type of life I want to lead. Let me say this. This is what type of life any Christian should want to lead. A life in all godliness and honesty. In all godliness and honesty. There's a problem with us if we don't want to live a godly life. If we're here saying, I, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to do these certain ungodly things. There's a problem with us. There's a problem in your heart. You need to search that out. You need to get that thing right. We should want to live a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Like if you're thinking of, should I do this? Should I say this? Should I act this way? Put it, to, put it to yourself like this. Would I do that if God was here with me right now? If God was here watching me do this, would I do it? If God was here watching me say this, would I say it? If God was here watching me act this way, would I do that? Would I express that opinion like that if God were standing here right, right next to me looking at me like, what, what are you doing? What are you saying? See, godliness. We should strive to live godly. This is what we should be looking for. This is why we pray for those that are over us so that we can live a godly life. Like, look at where our nation's at right now. It's making it harder for us to live a godly life. When they want us to support gay marriage and, and, and the whole gay agenda and the transgender movement and all of the, everything that goes along with that, they want us to to be accepting of it and say that it's a good thing and that it's right. It's, it's making it harder to live godly. Because we say, I can't endorse that. I can't accept that. I can't approve of that. I don't have to be an outspoken critic about it everywhere I go, but I also don't have to give my support to it and say it's right. I don't have to bow my knee to to the God of this world, the God of the sodomite agenda. I don't have to do that. To transgender movement, to the transgender lunacy, I don't have to bow my knee to that. There's no need for us to do that. This is why we pray for those that are in authority over us, so we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and in all honesty. What else should we pray for? Look at verses 3 and 4. It goes on to say, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. All right, so here, when I look at these two verses right here, we're about to look at, I think of Calvinism. 
Calvinism says there's such a thing as irresistible grace, meaning that if, if God's calling you, there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to get saved. And if he's not, you're not going to get saved. God only calls the elect is what they say. And if you're not part of the elect, it doesn't matter what you do. You can never get saved. Okay, well, here's what God says about it. He says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. So I wonder if this is God's will. If it's good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, God and our Savior, God, our Savior, is this God's will? I say, yes, if, it, if the Bible is telling me this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, then I'd say, yeah, this is what God's accepting this. God wants this. Look at what he says next. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Look at verse 4, who will have how many? How many? All men. All men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So God, it says, who will. Okay, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will. So is that his will? Yes, that's his will. Who will have all men to be saved. So God's will is that how many men are saved? All of them. All men to be saved. It doesn't say all the elect. It says all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's God's will right there. So now, so what's one of the things we should pray for then? He said, I exhort, exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he goes on to say that, hey, God wants all men to be saved, so we should pray for the salvation of the lost. The salvation of the lost. We mentioned Alan tonight. You know, pray for the salvation of the lost. We're praying for people to get saved. I've got lots of family I, wanna, I want to come to know the Lord as their Savior. We're praying for them. God says we should pray for the lost, praying for all men, that all men might be saved. So we pray for civil government. We pray for men to be saved. Look at this. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. So this is part of the armor of God. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We want to pray for God's people. We want to pray for Christians. Why? He just went through. If we go back up, he says, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He says, my brethren, finally, my brethren. He's talking to the saved church members there in the church of Ephesus. And he's telling them to put on the whole armor of God. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then he asks, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. What's he saying? Why pray for the saints? Because they're going through this. Because their spiritual battle that we're in. And people get weary and it gets hard and the devil's shooting his darts out and we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we're doing. This is where we're at. Remember, I said it's two kingdoms battling. You're either part of God's kingdom or you're part of the devil's kingdom. There's two kingdoms that battle here. It's war. Spiritual battle. And God says, pray for each other. Pray for each other. Even if everything looks good on the outside, pray for people. 
Pray for one another in this church. We're asking God, God, bring us revival. God, revive us. Then let's pray for each other. Let's pray that God would bless people, that God would help people, that God would encourage people. And you know what else we could be? We could be that help. We could be that encouragement to somebody. <coughs> we have to get beyond our attitude being we just show up to church and we're just here. We have to get past that. We need the attitudes of we are servants. How can we serve each other? How can we serve one another? How can I come and be a blessing to somebody? How can I put a smile on somebody's face? How can I encourage somebody in their walk with God? How can I encourage someone to come soul winning? How can I encourage someone to, to sing a special? How can I encourage somebody to use their gifts and abilities for God? How can I do that? How can I be a part of that? What can I do to encourage somebody, to help somebody? What can I do to, 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 to help usher in the Spirit of God in this place so when people come in here, they feel the Spirit of God here? What can I do to bring that in, to make that happen? Yes, we pray for each other, but then we need to be what God wants us to be. We need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So we pray for Christians. I read it in verse 19, we pray for Christian workers. Paul, he says, and for me, that God would bless the work I'm doing, that God would give me boldness. When I see someone asking for boldness to share the gospel, I think I'm like, they're scared. Why else would you ask for boldness? I'm afraid. I don't know what to say. He's asking for boldness. So pray for Christian workers as well. Missionaries, preachers, those that are, you know, evangelists, those that are going out on the front lines and, 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 and taking the gospel to other places. Pray for them. Pray for Christian workers. We also need to pray for our daily needs. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, 9. Matthew 6, 9 says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What does he say in verse 11? He says to give us this day our daily bread. There's a need that we have. We have daily needs. And God says, pray for those daily needs. Pray for them. Pray for God to provide for the needs of your family for your needs. Ask for his provision. Don't we in America have a tendency to leave God out of this one. And we think it's all it's all up to me. I I just got to do this and I'm going to do this and we leave God out instead of asking God because we we get we live such a life of of such weak faith. If any faith at all, we live a life of weak faith because we get so dependent on on us just doing everything for ourselves and we don't recognize that it's all dependent on God that we're trusting God. Like your job, your great job that you have could end tomorrow. You get laid off. You get fired. You get hurt. You can't work. And then what happens when that happens? Oh, then now I'm going to get bitter and mad at God. How come God could let this happen to me? And God's saying the whole time, how come you were never praising me? How come you were never thanking me for that? I'm putting you in a position where you will start to thank me, where you will start to come to me and ask me to provide for your daily needs because you wouldn't do it before. And I'm not saying that God's always going to do that or, or that's what's hanging over our head if we don't. But I'm saying I know there's circumstances God will do things like that. That God does do things like that. And we need to get to where we're thanking God, we're praising God, and we're trusting God to provide for our every need. Instead of thinking it's all about me, your health is because of God. It, we take things for granted all the time. It could be gone just like that. Your health is because of God. Your ability to work is because of God. We need to get back to trusting God and stop looking to ourselves, 
stop looking to all the numbers and, and calculating all the numbers. And I, I was talking about earlier, we need to be faithful in our tithing. And what so many people do is they, they're going to make their budget. And then if there's anything left, we'll give it to God. God says, hey, I deserve the first fruits. I deserve the first fruits is what God says, not the leftovers. Why would you give me the leftovers? I've given you everything. I gave my life for you. And you just want to give me leftovers? Really? Wow. Thank you very much. God deserves the best, doesn't he? When we say that, yeah, God deserves the best. Amen. Why don't we give him the best? Why don't we give him the best of our time, the best of our energy, the best of our life? So many young people will say, oh, I'll serve God later when I'm older. Why won't you give him your best when you're young and have energy? Why wouldn't you give him that now? No, 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 that's later when I can be more dedicated to him because right now I just want to, I, I, and it'll always sound so good, I'm just focusing on my family right now. I'm just focusing on my job so I can take care of my family. Oh, that just sounds so good and all that, what all that sounds like to God is like, oh God, you're just second place, third, fourth. We don't give God first. Oh, but God, please bless us and send revival to our church. Why I keep you, you know, third, fourth, fifth on the list? God, how come you're not blessing my family? How come you're not blessing my job? You get a raise and it's like, oh man, look at what I got. I got a raise. Any thanks to God? No. No. See, we don't live trusting God. We have to start trusting God again. We have to start trusting God again. Do you know what happens when you start trusting God? You're going to get put in some scary situations. Because it's going to be like, oh, you trust me now. All right, awesome. God's excited about it. Hey, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. He says, oh, man, I see that faith. He says, here comes the test now. Anybody ever get nervous when you go into a test? Yeah. Especially when you don't know when it's coming, right? But that's where faith grows. When you're like, oh no, what, what are we going to do now? We're just going to trust God. We're going to trust God. And then when you get through that, and you trusted God, and you say, wow, look what God did. Look at what God did for us. God did that. And it's exciting to think about that. It's exciting to look back on. And you say, man, God did that. God, my God can do anything. And then you're excited about it. So I know my God can do anything. How do you know? Because He did this for me. And your faith grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And your excitement grows. And it becomes contagious. But we have to start living by faith. We have to ask God to provide for our daily needs. We have to trust Him for them. Jesus said, when you pray, pray after this manner. Give us this day our daily bread. I wonder if when he said that, if he knew what it was going to be like in 2024 in America. I think he did. Yet he still told us, pray, give us this day our daily bread. God, provide for me every day. Every day, God, I need you. So we pray for daily needs. We also pray for sicknesses and other problems that may come. Let's go to James chapter 5 and verse 14, if we would please. James chapter 5. We need to pray for sicknesses and other problems that we may have. We're in James chapter 5, verse 14. I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. It says, Paul speaking here, and he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And look at what he says next. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He said, I went to God three times on it. He said, I had this... Messenger of Satan, this thorn in the flesh, he said, and I went to God three times about this issue. He was talking to God. He was asking God, God, take this from me, please. So we go to God for sickness and other problems. James 5, 14. 
James says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Praying when we're sick. Praying when we're sick. These are the things we should pray for. Civil government, men to be saved. For Christians, for Christian workers, for our daily needs, for sicknesses. We're in James. Let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. <clears throat> James 1, 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If we go back up a little bit to verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So this is a trial that, they're, that someone's going through, a trial of their faith, and it says if you lack wisdom and how to deal with that, that's the context. If you don't know what to do, you're saying, I'm going through some trial and I really don't know what to do. God says, ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom in your trial. But many people, when they hit a trial, what they do is they just back out. They shut everything off, including God. And they just go at it alone. And they don't seek God. They don't ask God. God says, the, do the exact opposite. Do the exact opposite of what most people do. They withdraw. They stop talking to people. They won't get advice from anyone. They just get in their own head. And they just live in their own head and they're just, I'm going to do what I think is best. And I'm, I'm the be all, end all, know all. And I know what I'm going to do. I know what's best for me is kind of the attitude a lot of people take. Not everybody, but a lot of people take that attitude. And even if you're not physically saying that, you're, you're rejecting the wisdom of God. You're rejecting God's word and you're not looking to him for answers. So that's what you're doing by default. But what they should be doing, God says, is come to me for wisdom through this trial that you don't understand, that you've never been through before. God says, you know who understands? You know who's all-knowing? Who's all-wise? He says, I am. I am. And God says, come to me. Come to me. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Look at this. They give it to all men liberally. He's just throwing it out there. He's like, here, if you want wisdom, here. Come get it. Come ask for it. Seek it. Proverbs. Look at Proverbs, what Proverbs has to say about that. I think it's Proverbs 8. Wisdom's crying out in the streets. Hey, here I am. Here I am. God says he's got wisdom plenty. God giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Look at that. God says it shall be given to you. Ask him and he'll give it to you. Ask him, he will give it to you. So pray for wisdom. Hebrews chapter 4, we're in James, go back just a little bit. Hebrews chapter 4, we should pray for strength and mercy. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, I love this verse. He says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thank God for Jesus and what he's done for us. He understands what we're going through, it says in verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Jesus understands what you're going through. Every temptation you've felt, He's felt that temptation yet without sin. He understands where you're at. He gets it. He was without sin. And because we have Him as a high priest, Him as our mediator, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, we can come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Remember that grace? That's God's enabling power. Amen. God says, hey, come to me. Come to my throne of grace. How? Timid? Shy? Scared? No. How does He say? Come boldly. Why can we go boldly to the throne of grace? Man, thank God we have a big brother. Amen, Jesus Christ. Thank God for our Savior. Because of Jesus Christ, we can go boldly to the throne of grace because He's our high priest. We can go boldly, not timid, 
not shy. It doesn't mean we go rude and brash, but we can go boldly, reverently, yes, but we can go boldly to the throne of grace. Why? So we can obtain mercy. That's me not getting what I deserve. God have mercy on me. And not just that, not just that I don't get what I deserve, but I guess what else? God says we can find grace to help in time of need. Hey, that's why we go to the throne of grace. God, I need help. I don't know what to do here, God. Show me the next step. Show me what to do, God. I, I, I have no clue. I'm scared. I'm afraid. I'm worried. Whatever it is, we go boldly to the throne of grace. He says you're going to get mercy and you're going to get grace to help in your time of need. He says, I'm going to give you that grace. He says, I'm going to enable you. I'm going to give you my power to enable you to get through this trial. That's the thing. God's, it doesn't say God's removing the trial. He says, no, I'll give you grace to help in time of need. When you need it, I'm going to give it to you. Oh, we want it gone, right? We just, we just want God to be, you know, a genie in a bottle. Hey, hey, fix all my problems. God says, no, 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 I'm going to help you get through your problems. Why? Because you'll come out stronger on the other end. Think about Job. Man, I hope I never have to go through what Job went through. Can I just say that right off the bat? I would hate to have to go through what Job went through. I don't know that I could come out of it like he did. I really, I just, being honest, I don't think I could. He lost everything. Everything. And yet he said at the end of this, I'm going to come forth like gold. It, it doesn't say, if you've ever read through Job, it was not easy for him. He struggled. He had a hard time. He had to, God had to correct him on some things when you read through it. You know, those last three, four chapters, I think it's the last three chapters, four maybe, um, God had to correct him on some things. He wasn't perfect on, in it, but he did a good job. I mean, from our perspective, he did a great job, right? Amen, I think so. But he said, I'm going to come forth as gold when I get through this trial that's testing. I'm going to have learned some things. God's going to have taught me some things. And that's, what, that's how God works. He says, no, 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 I'm not going to take you out of this trial, I'm going to get you through this trial. You, we think back to the three Hebrew boys that were thrown into the fiery furnace, right? God didn't keep them from going in that furnace. But guess what? He went there through it with them. He's, if you're in a trial right now, He's right there with you. He's right there with you. Have the faith to see Him. Have the faith to see Him. Have the faith of the three, you know, he, Hebrew boys that got thrown, that wouldn't, you know, bow down. That wouldn't worship the king. Have the faith they had. God is with you in the trial. He's with you in the fire. And he will give you what you need to get through it. To grow. Stop living in the here and now. That's our problem is we live in the here and now. And all we think about is right here and now. And how it affects me instead of, you know what God, what are you doing through this for me? What are you trying to teach me through this problem I'm going through? Through this issue I'm going through? Through this trial? God, what are you trying to teach me? And, and start asking those questions instead of why am I going through this? You might never know why you're going through it. I don't know if Job even knows right now why he went through all that. I mean, what answers could we give so he can come forth like gold? Right? Like, really, we don't really know what God's reason. On, we can surmise why. Here's some things we think why. We don't know. Maybe Job doesn't even know yet. I don't know. Maybe the first thing he asked God was like, why did I have to go through that? I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. We may never know why we're going through something. But we can, instead of asking why, we can ask God, what are you trying to teach me? God, what do you want me to get out of this? God, what can I learn from this? And I'm going to say a lot of times it's going to be, maybe there's someone later on down the road you're going to be able to help. Maybe there's someone on, later on down the road you're going to be able to empathize with and be like, I've been there. I know what it's like. I know what you're going through and you can get through it. God will get you through it. He did it for me and he'll do it for you. And you can take him right here to Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, 12, sorry, 16, sorry. Hebrews four sixteen. I was looking at chapter five where it said, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And you say, God, God gave me that grace when I needed it. He helped me when I needed it. He was there for me. So we pray for our civil government, for men to be saved, for Christians, for Christian workers, for our daily needs, for sicknesses and other problems, for wisdom, for strength and mercy. 
And lastly, one of the things we pray for, again, this isn't a be-all, end-all list. We pray for all things, all things. Go to Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4. We have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. We want a uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Pray for all things. All things. Just whatever you're going through, whatever life is bringing your way. All things. Philippians 4, 6 says, be careful for nothing. That means don't worry about everything. Don't. Just be always thinking, oh, this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. I'm, I'm, giving, I'm caring about. I'm, I'm putting all my care towards this thing and this thing and this thing. It, it, it means just worrying about every little thing. God's saying, don't do that. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, in everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, look at this, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In everything, God says, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See, we're not doing these things through Christ. We're doing these things through our own strength. And God says you need to do it through me because that's where the peace of God comes. That's where the strength comes is when you do it through me. This is where the, the keeping of your heart and your mind comes. It comes through me. You're worrying about everything. God says, well, you're not doing it through me. You're doing it through you, so keep worrying about it. Keep being worried. Keep being scared. Keep being afraid of everything. Keep being scared of the unknown. Because you, you by yourself, yeah, you better worry. You with me, you got nothing to worry about. You trust me. Follow me. Little sheep, stay next to me. I'm the shepherd. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. See, peace comes... When we take things to God with thanksgiving, you want peace in your life, then follow this verse. But that takes faith to follow that verse. You want peace in your life, follow that verse. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Don't leave that part out. Don't leave that part out. Every time I read this verse and start to really think on it, it always reminds me of Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy when they were in a concentration camp under the Nazis. And Corey tells the story of her sister. They get thrown into, they get moved from one concentration camp to another. And they get thrown into the, the barracks. And they get there early. And it's just so crowded. There's barely any room for them to crawl. They're just stacked. And their bed's like in the middle. And they crawl in, you know, on like the, the third row or something. They crawl in all the way to get in their bed. And they're laying there. And the, 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 the beds are just basically straw. And they're laying there. And they realize they have all these fleas crawling all over them. And they crawl out and they're just, you know, obviously just trying to just bat them all off of them. And they're just, imagine what they're going through, you know, just being in a concentration camp and just things are just as bad as they can be. Awful situation. Their father, they don't know what's happened to him, but he's dead. I mean, their whole family basically got arrested at the same time and hauled off to prison and they don't know what happened to anyone. The two sisters are together still and that's about what they know. and. They're in this concentration camp. They get put to a new place. They don't know anyone there. And here they are with fleas all over them. And Betsy says, you know what? Let's pray. And Corey, she's just bitter and angry and mad inside. She's just mad as can be. And, she, and she's listening to her sister pray. And her sister starts going, Jesus, thank you for the fleas. And that just gets her even more mad. That gets Corey even more mad. She's just so mad at her. And She's like not really even praying. She's opening her eyes and she's looking at her sister like, what is wrong with you? How are you thanking God for these fleas? Like, how can you do that right now? Look what we're going through. Look what's happened to us. Look where we're at. And you're thanking God for these fleas. And her sister, just joyous as can be, who's just all sickly and, you know, getting closer and closer to death because of her health, is just thanking God for fleas. And Corey's so mad at it. And just they just go on and they keep living there. And then... They're able to start, you know, they, they smuggle a Bible in and they're able to start having Bible studies and they're sharing the gospel and they're bringing joy and peace into that barracks where before there was fighting and 
you know, the women were at each other's throats and it was just cutthroat. And it gets to where they're able to turn it around through, through the power of Christ. They're able to turn it around and just bring a sweet spirit there and everyone's working together. And, and it's just a sweet spirit, even in this horrible, awful place. And it dawns on them one day, they're, they're sitting there thinking about it, talking, and the sisters realize, you know what? The guards never come into our barracks here. At the other concentration camp, the guards were always in and out of the barracks. So they really had no peace. They couldn't have Bible studies like they do. They couldn't talk about God. But in this one, the guards never come there. And they realize the reason the guards never come there is because of the fleas. Thank God for fleas. Who's going to thank God for fleas, right? God says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We can't leave that off. We have to be thankful. Whatever the situation, as bad as it may be, be thankful. Be thankful. So we pray for civil government, for the salvation of souls, for Christians, for Christian workers, for our daily needs, for sicknesses, for wisdom, for strength and mercy, and then for all things, for all things. Christians, this is what a prayer life we need. This is the type of faith we need. We need to have faith. Don't let your prayers be so generic that you're just praying for, you know, I pray for world peace. What, what does that mean? Like that's not going to come until Jesus Christ comes. So if you're going to say that, just pray, I'm praying for the return of Christ soon. That's better than just world peace. You know, I'm praying for people to be saved. Name them. Just name them. Name I'm praying for this person to be saved. Be specific. That's prayers of faith are specific. Prayers of faith are specific. You know, people will come into churches and it's, you know, prayer meeting time and take prayer requests and they'll be like, I'm just praying for the sick people everywhere. Well, who? Pray what for them? How do we know? Like, God just like sprinkle fairy dust on them and if it hits you, like you're healed. Like, pray specifically. That's a prayer of faith because then you know, hey, God answered my prayer. Amen. God answered my prayer. Prayers of faith are specific prayers. Be specific. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for this day, Lord. Please dismiss us with your blessing and help us, Lord, to use us, Lord, to usher in revival into this church. Work in our hearts and our souls and our minds and our bodies, God. That we would be the Christians you want us to be, Lord. That we would be praying, faith-filled Christians. Lord, please, teach us to pray. Teach us to have faith. To live for you, to love you, and to love others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.